All right, welcome everybody to rounds on this morning, September 6th. We will get started here, maybe. Doesn't want to advance. Okay. So first case is the right eye from a four month old Labrador retriever. The history we got is uh, Bouthalmus, uh, superficial blood vessels extending axially from the limbus 360 degrees, protruded fibrovascular granulation tissue in the axial cornea, pigmented tissue adhering to the innermost side of the entire cornea, no visible anterior chamber, unable to assess the intraocular structures. The rule outs they gave us were congenital glaucoma, corneal perforation associated with ophthalmia neonatorum, given the history, and I'll tell you the other bit of the history, um, because the owner noticed a pink fleshy mass on the eye when he opened his eyes around two weeks of age. Um, for the other eye, they say it is microphthalmic and has Peter's anomaly. So as a reminder, Peter's anomaly is an axial uh, defect, that means central corneal defect. Um, usually there's a deep corneal stromal defect that involves, and then the iris is attached to that area. Um, that is one variety of a number of um, anterior segment dysgenesis in uh, humans, at least. We use the term as well. Um, so um, that's a pretty interesting history. So here's the globe. Uh, when we hemisected it, the vitreous was liquefied, so there's no vitreal body left in here. The lens was absent, so there's no evidence of lens or lens capsule that we can see grossly. Um, here's the little pink fleshy mass that they uh, described clinically and that the owner noticed. Um, it's not quite at the cut edge, so we're kind of getting the horizon of it there. And then down here, there's this little tiny white worm extending from where the optic nerve is, which is right here. Um, so we assume this was the retina that was detached and torn. Uh, the lens was absent, presumably extruded through um, a corneal perforation. Um, the other option is aphakia, where it truly did not develop, but that's incredibly rare. And usually when that happens, there's really significant um, developmental problems in the anterior segment because the lens is really important for the cues, uh, the development of cues during uh, eye development to develop the uh, anterior chamber. Um, so uh, we have, uh, when we submitted it in the cassette in order to fit it into a mega cassette, we cut it. Um, so you'll see that the, um, what it looks like on the slide is a little bit different from that. So. So I will give you a tour. So. Here's the cornea. And you can't really see the iris because it literally is lining the entire back of the uh, front of the eye. I should have pointed that out better on the gross photo, but I forgot. Um, back here is one of the ciliary body plique right here. Um, and as we come around, um, here is the optic nerve. Here's uh, the only sampling of that little worm of retina that we have right there. So basically we cut the globe to get it to fit into the mega cassette. I actually got two deeper sections to try to sample that stuff that was happening in the axial cornea. And I will show the deeper one of those two. So um, here is the cornea. And here is that uh, white mass here. So we'll start there. And this one, the optic nerve was not sampled very well at all. So. Focus, Gillian. Okay. Um, so here is cornea, believe it or not. Here's something more recognizable as cornea, perhaps, over in this direction. Mm -hmm. The corneal epithelium is hypoplastic, meaning it is too thick. These are too many, too many cell layers thick. Um, it's maybe mildly keratinized on the surface. And then the stroma itself is uh, definitely vascularized. You can see a number of blood vessels in here. It's also quite disorganized in a way. So this is a quote unquote fibrotic corneal stroma. And then uh, as we get closer, never mind, that's some junk. 
Okay. Oh, well, actually, a few of these epithelial cells have a little bit of melanin pigment in them. Um, so there's some epithelial pigmentation as well. And as we move into that area where the pink fleshy mass was, you can see that there's this area of corneal se or epithelial separation and this sort of cleft formation here. And let's go one lower, actually. So right here, you can see here's the epithelium. Here's this uh, stuff that is very different in appearance from the corneal stroma. And so this is sort of a loose neuropill-like uh, material with some kind of bland, embedded, maybe spindle to stellate cells. Um, there's also a little bit of mineral that's subtending the corneal epithelium up there. Um, so, and there's also blood vessels running through this uh, neuropill-like uh, tissue. Um, so what we believe this is, is actually the retina or the artist formerly known as retina. Um, after it has um, been extruded through a deep corneal stromal defect. Um, and actually that's our theory about where the lens went in this case as well, is that uh, there was some sort of corneal defect through which the lens was extruded and the, most of the retina. Um, this one also happens to have an embedded hair shaft, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, gross, exactly. <laughs> um, and then, so the other part of the corneal puzzle is where's Decimase membrane? And actually, it's actually very difficult to discern in this case. What we have here is actually irritable stroma and it's sort of blending in with the deep corneal stroma. So we have complete anterior chamber collapse with broad anterior sneakia where the iris is uh, broadly adhered to the back of the cornea. Um, I did not order a PAS stain on this case, but it would certainly have helped to uh, visualize Decimase membrane or to identify it, I should say. Um, here's more of that mineral that's sub, sub subtending the corneal epithelium. This is uh, relatively common in my experience in really abnormal uh, eyes from babies, uh, from young animals. And I don't know exactly what the pathogenesis is there, uh, but we still call it band keratopathy. Um, and then that there's not a whole lot else to look at here um, as far as this goes. I will go back to that. Yeah, there's really nothing else to really look at inside the eye. I will go back to that little nubbin of retina and we can appreciate it. Um, so there it is. Remember, it was that little white worm in the gross photo. This is the only area where it was actually sampled. Um, and so this is a diffusely detached and uh, torn retina because it, it's no longer attached at the aura serrata. Um, and it is atrophied as well. So we're actually lacking most of the retinal layers. What we have left here are probably a bunch of photoreceptor nuclei. And actually you can see how similar this uh, tissue right here looks to what was trapped up under the corneal epithelium. Um, so yeah, as I said, there's not a whole lot else to appreciate in this case. So we'll just go back to the PowerPoint and talk about our diagnoses. Um, so there's a whole bunch written here. And basically we, use a term or a phrase, early life trauma slash anterior chamber collapse syndrome, which is, we believe, um, evidence of um, some sort of issue very early in the patient's life, often before the eyelids open, um, and that involves a corneal defect or um, lesion or something where um, either the lens and or the retina can be extruded. Um, behind the closed eyelids. So remember that puppies and kittens eyes don't open until, until they're about two weeks of age. Um, however, in this case, given the history of the other eye having problems and they've already diagnosed Peter's anomaly in the other eye, I uh, diff used, I included Peter's anomaly as a differential, including, and that's also um, historically known as anterior chamber cleavage syndrome, which is a, a throwback to the development of the eye. Um, aphakia means no more lens, uh, presumed extruded through that corneal defect, diffuse retinal detachment and tear and presumed extrusion through the corneal defect uh, with entrapment in the axial cornea, uh, multiple, multifocal breaks in decimase membrane, and then anterior chamber collapse with broad anterior sneakia, and chronic glaucoma, presumed secondary in this case, um, based on the broad anterior sneakia. However, there are uh, forms of Peter's anomaly or um, anterior segment dysgenesis in humans where there is an abnormal irritable corneal angle and you have um, abnormal aqueous humor outflow, which can lead to a congenital glaucoma. In this case, you can't really tell the difference because of that distortion of the irritable corneal angle. Um, I'm trying to remember what else um, I had to say about this. But anyway, so I don't, it's hard to say 
uh, what the actual etiology is. I have actually begun to suspect that all of the cases or many of the cases of quote unquote early life trauma anterior chamber collapse syndrome um, maybe originally had some sort of axial corneal defect that then um, predisposed them to have this uh, extrusion of the lens and or the retina. Um, so they might all originate as sort of Peter's anomaly um, or some sort of axial corneal defect. Um, so that's my my theory. Uh, it will be very difficult to prove. Yeah, I think that's, um, I like that a lot. And just to clarify one thing that I, I got asked last week about this, um, we did the same, I, I did the same thing in another case and the clinician asked me, um, you know, when I did the ax Peter's anomaly, if then, um, if we assume there was Peter's anomaly and it was something congenital, that the other changes were also congenital, like the aphakia, and that one also had extrusion of the of the, the retina. So I, th I think it's important to, to say that when we say we think there was Peter's anomaly, uh, we definitely think there was a rupture, traumatic or not. At some point, there was a rupture that the lens extruded, and in this case, the retina is extruded. Uh, not that if we think this were congenital, that the retina, you know, the, the the retina in the cornea or the absence of lens is part of the congenital abnormality. No, if the idea is that there was Peter's anomaly, and then it ruptured, and then uh, you got extrusion of the retina and the lens, or not, or it was just trauma. But uh, for sure, there was a uh, uh, a corneal rupture at some point with extrusion of the intraocular tissues. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I should say we see this in dogs and cats. Uh, I feel like we see it more commonly in dogs, but sometimes we see it in cats where uh, the diagnosis is uh, convoluted because of the possible contribution of herpes virus uh, causing corneal issues. And then we also have a few cases in other species. I think we have a couple. Uh, we have a couple in horses. We have a couple, at least one in a wallaby and a bear. Calf. calf. Yeah, a calf, maybe a rabbit or two. So, I mean, it, it does happen in all kinds of species, which um, maybe helps to rule out at least, well, never mind, let's not say that. So anyway, so interesting case, um, something that we see. And um, I was going to say, so Peter's anomaly is just one specific type of anterior segment dysgenesis, quote unquote, the way they call it in human um, uh, ocular pathology um, or ophthalmology. And there are a number of different uh, syndromes that can lead to similar or more complicated lesions of the anterior segment of the eye in humans. Um, and sometimes we'll see <clears throat> some different uh, syndromes um, in dogs and cats, et cetera, that uh, might uh, correlate with some of those different syndromes in people. And also I should say um, in the Portuguese water dog um, in quote unquote puppy eye syndrome, um, I think there's something inherited in that breed uh, where they can have uh, some of the forms of anterior segment dysgenesis. Um, so, yeah. Okay, moving on. Next case. So, uh, the next case is not a puppy. This is a 10 year old pointer. Um, so, kind of an interesting history here. Uh, previous enucleation of the other eye in October of 2022. Um, it was diagnosed at a, uh, we don't have that report here, um, through one of the bigger diagnostic labs. Um, and it was something like endophthalmitis. There may have been corneal disease and or perforation. I can't remember exactly. Um, anyway, and so the, the, this eye, the one that we just received was normal at that time. However, over the last six weeks, this eye developed massive inflammation. Um, originally Iris Bombay, uh, meds were initiated but failed. Um, the previous report mentioned trauma, but this never occurred per the owner. Um, and the clinician said very weird case and trying to figure it out. So luckily we were able to help them figure it out, but it's a sad story. Um, they also provided the fact that the dog was tested for blastomycosis and was negative. CBC chem was with, were within normal limits and the chest x-ray was clear. Um, so when we received the globe, it was bufalmic, uh, which means it was enlarged. And uh, there was an axial, um, uh, well, paraxial maybe, corneal defect um, that's kind of sampled paraxially here. We're not actually at the defect right here, um, but there is a corneal perforation or rupture at this point. The cornea is otherwise opaque. 
And this sort of tan to brownish to reddish tissue um, fills the anterior chamber and effaces the iris and extends into the ciliary body. The, here's the lens. There is a cataract uh, plus, plus or minus lens capsule rupture. And um, then the retina is detached um, and maybe a little bit thicker than it should be. Um, so those are the gross changes. Now we will go ahead and jump into the microscopic regions. Maybe. All right. So um, wherever things are too purple, that means there are lots of cells. So um, the iris is effaced, it's thickened, it's too purple. So that means it's quite cellular. Unfortunately, we have some big old cover slip scratches on here. And then here is that corneal defect. So there's some schmoo coming out that defect. Uh, here's the lens, uh, there is a cataract. And then as we move back, the retina is detached and maybe also has a little bit more uh, purple layering than it should. So there's something going on there with the lens that shouldn't, that shouldn't be. All right. So um, there is in fact a corneal defect. So here's the cornea on one side, here's the cornea on the other. It is um, ulcerated broadly leading up to that. And there's quite a bit of infiltration. Some of this is uh, blood vessels and a lot of it is probably neutrophils because of that ulceration and rupture. And same with the other side, you can really appreciate the vascularization or granulation tissue formation in the corneal stroma. Um, but the main event, uh, as Megan likes to say, is um, this uh, expansion of the iris by a densely cellular infiltrate. And right off the bat at this magnification, uh, you can really appreciate that there are some really enormous cells in here. Um, and then, so these are very large uh, cells that have more than one nucleus. So I don't know, this one might have up to 20 or something like that. This one might have a few, uh, somewhat fewer and a fewer here. Um, there, the rest of the infiltrate is sort of kind of pleomorphic uh, in that the cell shapes and sizes are not necessarily homogeneous. Um, so it's kind of a heterogeneous looking population. We also have, so, uh, well, let's see here. So their cytoplasm is kind of vacuolated and their nuclei have uh, some coarsely clumped chromatin and variably prominent nucleoli. Um, over here is one that's undergoing mitosis and it's a giant mitotic figure, some, some abnormal mitotic figures. And then there are some inflammatory cells around. I think this is actually a plasma cell. Um, and also uh, here's a nice, I bumped it and found a good spot. Um, good job. So some of these cells also contain melanin in their cytoplasm. I think that's the previous one. Recording just, yes, yeah, Okay. Um, so, uh, we have, and here's another mitotic figure here. Um, so, and there's also some other scattered inflammatory cells, like some neutrophils here and there. Um, we're not seeing very many um, native, uh, normal looking uveal melanocytes anymore. Um, and let's move back into the eye. There are areas of necrosis. So this area with all the pink schmoo is all areas of necrosis. There's a little bit of hemorrhage mixed in there. Here's the lens, there was a cataract. Move back here. So the same, uh, sorry, not inflammatory. The same neoplastic cell population is also carpeting the choroid. And then when we look at the retina, it's also carpeting both sides of the retina. So um, we have a somewhat heterogeneous, kind of ugly looking, malignant looking uh, neoplasm that's in the uveal stroma and also sort of traveling around the eye. It's carpeting some the retina and some other structures. Um, this degree of pleomorphism is strongly suggestive of a histiocytic sarcoma, which is a very aggressive form of neo round cell neoplasm um, from the histiocytic cell origin or macrophage origin. Um, 
And so I, as I pointed out, some of those cells did have melanin in their cytoplasm. And so sometimes we have to differentiate that from a malignant melanoma. Uh, malignant melanomas don't tend to have gigantic multinucleated cells, although they can be pleomorphic where there's some degree of cellular variation size and also nuclear uh, size variation. However, this it would be unusual to see that degree in a malignant melanoma. So my top differential for this was a histiocytic sarcoma. I suggested they do immunohistochemistry to, to confirm that, and they did take us up on that offer. So we did a CD204 to identify to identify histiocytic origin cells, and we used a red chromogen, which is very helpful in the uvea. And right off the bat, you can see how very pink um, this uh, uveal stroma is. And when we go higher mag, you can see a lot of these cells have pink in their cytoplasm. Um, and the real kicker is to find some of those um, gigantic cells. And some, but not all of them, have at least some degree of pink chromogen uh, positivity in their cytoplasm. Um, yeah, that one proves your point where there's positive, you know, uh, I'd say positivity and melanin in the cytoplasm at the same time. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah, since we go higher mag, I appreciate that. Sorry, which uh, I have CD204. Oh. Um, yeah, so this one has pink in its cytoplasm and it also has melanin, all the darker brown is the melanin. Um, so um, this does confirm our, uh, or my top differential of histiocytic sarcoma, which is sad news for the dog uh, because um, um, histiocytic sarcomas, once they are diagnosed in the eye, um, pretty much indicate that there's a very poor prognosis for the patient, and most of them are uh, have passed away or have been euthanized within three months of diagnosis. Uh, we do not know whether um, these tumors develop in the eye and then go systemic from the eye, or if we are catching them at an already metastatic stage and um, they've already affected uh, organs um, that were unknown at this point uh, when the eye is nucleated. Um, other things? I guess the reason we say that is because we do have a surprising number of cases where we make this diagnosis and there's no history of systemic disease whatsoever. By the time they really see the eye, the first hint of a histocytic sarcoma or a mass or the tumor overall is in the eye. It could be that that's just because, you know, you can see in the eye, you see the mass or on the other hand, uh, you know, kind of devil's advocate that it had started, yeah, and then became systemic. But regardless, they, uh, the patients tend to do poorly, uh, you know, with or without systemic signs by the time they're in the they are enucleated. Yeah. I mean, you do have primary histiocytic sarcomas that arise from the central nervous system right. too, and those some there's very few of them recorded. I think it was just a paper, like a retrospective paper, but it was a very small number of cases, like ten or eleven. But a lot of them will be fine in the central nervous system. But you're saying like most of the ones that are found in the eye, they eventually do find systemic disease. Um, we are in the process of trying to figure that out. Okay. Uh, we're that would be cool. We have a project yeah. running now, but um, yeah, they we have uh, many cases that we, they didn't come up with a uh, uh, history of systemic disease by the time it wasn't created, mm -hmm. but then either when we sent a report or they contacted us meanwhile, say, hey, can you check that uh, case because the dog is not doing well. So either it became systemic or it was already systemic and nobody yeah. figured it yeah, out. That's hard to tell. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, I mean, I know for the, um, for the central nervous system ones, we were looking into some other markers to see if it was a particular subset of histiocytic cool. cell. But mm. as we all know, like histiocytic markers mm. are kind of limited on fixed tissues. Cynic heat. Yeah, yeah, and finicky. So. Yeah. Um, and back to this case. So back to Sorry. the no, no, it's totally fine. That's nope. good. It's yeah, great. That's great. Uh back to this case. So I forgot I should come back to so this dog's other eye was enucleated in October. I really so obviously I don't have access to that slide. Um, I would hope that no pathologist would mistake this for endophthalmitis, like a strictly inflammatory condition. Um, so I'm doubtful that it was a tumor in the other eye. Um, and also I'm doubtful in one, in another way because I don't think the dog would have lasted this long if it had actually been a histiocytic sarcoma in the other eye. So um, 
on, this dog just had incredibly bad luck um first losing an eye to some other problem and then um now developing developing this really awful tumor in its remaining eye so um yeah um who knows um it'd be cool to see that initial slide Megan you're up direction you want to the lessons for the clinic, future clinicians, mm -hmm. like maybe for when you send things in. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like my ability to fix process scores without tripping and or anything out of the wall. Mm -hmm. The next case is a guinea pig. Sorry. <laughs> Someone here work. really likes guinea pigs. A <laughs> uh, five year, six month old female guinea pig. Uh, they describe a uveitis with opaque material in the anterior chamber that varies in color from white to red. Uh, the pet appears blind in the eye. Um, and prior to this, the pet had a juvenile cataract described in this eye. Um, so, all interesting pieces of history. Uh, here is the gross view. Um, we have an image from the front of the uncut eye, um, and we have the hemisected view um, uh, here on the right. So through the front, you can actually see basically exactly what they described in the history, um, a tissue in the anterior chamber that varies from, from white to red. So there you go. Um, and then on the hemisected view, there is a pretty significant cataract. Um, and you can also see the iris and ciliary body kind of in the middle here. Um, basically sandwiched between this sort of whitish tissue. Um, and a further piece of information from the gross evaluation that is significant is uh, when we were sectioning this, um, it was gritty and hard to get the blade through it uh, and required some level of uh, decalcification. <laughs> so um, it's probably already a, a hint, but uh, let's take a look at the histo. That's a legend. There we go. This whole eyeball will probably fit in this level of a subgross. That's so cute. Here's our tiny adorable eye with the cornea at the top. Um, so here's cornea. We have our lens in the middle, which is looking really sort of sad and small and wrinkled, um, definitely a pretty significant cataract. And then there's all this pink tissue um, where we had white and the gross before, and in the middle of some of these pink lobules, uh, purple with lots of cells. So um, stuff that's interesting to look at. Uh, we also don't have the optic nerve well captured, but there's the retina back here. Um, I don't know, there's not much else to say apart from what's going on up here. So let's take a closer look. We have rotated the eye 90 degrees clockwise. So here's the cornea on our right, and that stuff in the anterior chamber. It's lining the anterior iris. It's kind of diving into the ciliary cleft um, and uh, surrounding the lens equator and lining the anterior surface of the lens as well. We're going to drop in on this little lobule in particular. Or structure in particular. So, I mean, without further beating around the bush, this is bone. Um, and in fact, uh, this is a pretty well-developed bone in which you actually have basically bone marrow um, that is developing in the middle. Okay. Uh, now I do. <laughs> um, you can even see megakaryocytes in this bone marrow. Isn't that cool? Uh, so this is fully developed bone in the eye of this guinea pig. Very nice. Um, and the other feature that's pretty interesting in this particular guinea pig's eye is this is the lens or kind of what remains of the lens. Uh, the lens capsule is very wrinkled and except for maybe over here where you can see some remaining lens fibers, which are looking pretty tattered and most of the lens fibers are resorbed. Uh, the entire inside of the lens is basically filled with this um, somewhat disorganized fibrillar collagen. Um, and the lens capsule is also discontinuous, but you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, we have a PIS to highlight the basement membrane and make it easier to see that. So here's our PIS. 
yeah, look at how pretty this lens capsule is. It's, there's doubling, there's discontinuities. It just sort of peters out into the collagen here. Um, very wrinkled. So let's just take a minute to kind of pass over this lens. There we go. So uh, this is a ruptured lens with a hypermature cataract. Actually, at this level, we see some more liquefied lens protein and some excitable hyperplastic and hypertrophied lens epithelium in there too. Um, Wow. Yeah, it's a pretty cool looking lens. Um, so uh, this case has uh, intraocular bone or osseous metaplasia, or um, probably more correctly termed heterotopic bone. Um, and it also has lens capsule rupture with a hypermature cataract. So let's go to the PowerPoint to show that off. Um, People also call this osseous core stoma in guinea pigs. Uh, it is a condition that has been described in guinea pigs. Um, typically, the bone will form uh, in the area of the iris base and or ciliary body um, and possibly obstruct aqueous outflow. Um, the kind of unique feature about this case, though, is that uh, there was also bone developing around the lens and the lens capsule rupture with, uh, with cataract. Um, which is not something we always see in uh, heterotopic bone or osseous chorostoma in uncomplicated cases. Um, it isn't really known why heterotopic bone or osseous chorostoma occurs in guinea pigs. Um, it's kind of idiopathic at this point. Uh, in this case, the bone development, um, basically the lens capsule rupture may have contributed to the bone development in some way. Um, we'll sometimes see in other species um, uh, bone development around a ruptured lens. Um, so basically kind of either or may have been associated with the development of bone in this particular eye. Um, so just a, a really cool case that's kind of a, um, a uh, findings that are already described, but also with some non-classic findings too. Um, so uh, any, well, I, I usually ask for questions here, but, but we've got questions covered. All right, uh, that's it for this case and I'm gonna move on. So this one is not guinea pig, this one is a dog. Mm -hmm. There we go. This is an 8.2 year old male golden retriever. Um, the the clinician in this case writes biggest globe I've ever removed. Um, so yeah, uh, this is a rather large globe. Um, they describe uh, bouthalmia, uh, two plus flare, iris bombay with blood tinged fibrin. Um, in the left eye and a little bit of flare in the right eye back in June. And then basically over time, the, this globe developed um, increasingly severe corneal disease and enlargement. Um, and then also uh, it's un, uh, uncertain if it's related uh, basically at the time we received this eye, but eventually this dog also developed a sort of seeping uh, um, skin lesion on the leg. Um, so uh, this is the eye. Um, again, we have a front view from the left, uh, on the left side with the eye on cuts and then the hemisected view on the right hand side. Um, you can see that the cornea is completely opaque in this case. There's an axial, rather large axial depression um, and then the sort of white to tan to red uh, discoloration in the cornea. Um, on the cut view, that uh, de depressed area is pretty red brown and the cornea is basically opaque and extremely thickened, uh, maybe a little bit tangentially sectioned here, but um, and then there's all of this white tan tissue that is in the episclera, the sclera, and definitely uh, at least the anterior uvea and probably other parts of the uveal tract as well. There's a cataract and the um, globe is full of blood. Um, so uh, we will take a look at the histo now. Mm -hmm. Nope, not that button. This button. This is a rather large slide, as you might expect. Uh, so the subgrowth probably isn't going to be great. Um, this nicely. Here we go. Here we go. Um, so you can see here demonstrated the difficulties in sectioning a rather large piece of solid tissue um, into one slide like this. Um, we definitely have a lot of artifact going on. The lens has basically dropped out in this section. Um, but what we can see in this image, uh, you're going to have to trust me for right now that the cornea is up here. Um, 
And we have all of that tissue that was kind of white tan uh, in the episclera and sclera, which is now very purple, which again, we know that there's tons of cells there. Um, here's the back of the eye. We do have the optic nerve. We have detached uh, segments of retina just coming into view. So I won't spend too much time on this slide because there are better slides to be had, but we have this uh, dense, highly cellular population, which is um, pretty much circumferentially and variably infiltrating many of the ocular tissues. There's the optic nerve. We're on our way more up front. Here we go. Uh, we have um, a little bit of folding here, but uh, here's the um, cornea kind of at the edge of it. Um, there's very broad corneal ulceration. This area here that was sort of red brown, it's very folded, but um, you can see uh, closer to that the um, corneal stroma in that area, which was in an ulcer bed basically, is very polycellular, um, condensed and brightly eosinophilic. Um, so it's uh, necrotic um, and there's also keratitis. So bad corneal disease. And we'll look at the other slides to look at these pop the cell population closer. We're gonna call that a sequestrum. Um, I think Is you could call it a sequestrum, yeah. If you have a, a discrete area of corneal necrosis, um, you can call it a sequestrum. No, I was just curious because that's I, what we were. It's kind of what we were painting in. into. Yeah. So okay. So here are some sections uh, through the rest of the globe that are a little bit smaller. And as a result, they have a little bit less artifact. Um, so here we have um, basically a, a section that's up near the limbus. Um, this is a piece of conjunctiva, which is sort of folding over on itself, just to tr sort of try to orient you because this whole um, section is pretty effaced. Um, there's a little bit of sclera coming in on this side. And we have this uh, same dense uh, neoplastic population that's invading into the orbital tissue here, um, wrapping around these uh, individual myocytes in the skeletal muscle. Um, so without any further ado, there's already been much ado already. Let's take a look at who they are. Um, and this neoplasm passes the tweezers test, even from this magnification. Um, basically, each neoplastic cell is very sharply demarcated. So a little bit of a space around each one. If you reached in there with a pair of tweezers, like you're playing a game of operation, you could easily pluck one out without disturbing its neighbors. Um, so this is a round cell neoplasm. Um, getting closer. Let's just keep going. Let's put it denser. Um, and there's a fair amount of nuclear pleomorphism here um, and rather large nuclei. Um, and uh, yeah, long story short, this is a round cell neoplasm. Um, we uh, ended up diagnosing this one as a lymphoma. I don't believe that we've phenotyped it yet, um, but just a um, pretty spectacular, um, significant degree of uh, infiltration and destruction of the ocular tissues associated with this round cell neoplasm. Um, yeah, I don't think I have much else to say. So the main diagnosis here was the um, brown cell neoplasm, uh, which um, it would be, we basically would probably want to confirm that with IHC before making a definitive diagnosis of lymphoma. Um, and then presumably the really severe corneal disease was the result of exposure of that cornea. Um, the dog was probably going to have a hard time um, blinking over that uh, large eye um, and distributing the tear film nicely. Um, so that's it, that's that case. I will hand the floor over to Jane. Um, like, you know, it was a dog. This was a extra Um, so with lymphomas, uh, we um, have the paper that came out about um, presumed solitary ocular lymphoma versus uh, metastatic. So, I mean, ultimately, with um, we have like certain idea of the odds of whether it's primary or metastatic. Um, ultimately, on histologic exam, I can't be sure it's uveal for sure. Um, it, basically, we would need full staging the patient and you know the clinical interpretation to couple with that to be positive. Um, I think when we call it uveal here, it just means that it's a oh, okay. it doesn't imply that it is. It's targeted. Yeah. yeah. More like a morphologic location. But that, that's a good question. Yeah. A really good point, actually, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that's fair. Strong. It's going to be ocular slash periocular. 
or, or the government? Yeah, probably ocular might have been a safer bet to call it. Um, basically, the, the neoplastic cells were kind of around the edges of the eye and not necessarily filling the chambers. So I'd be kind of hedging my bets a bit. But um, yeah, I mean, maybe it would have been uh, safer to just call it ocular lymphoma in this case. Yeah, at some point, it's just for if someone end up reading that morphologic diagnosis out of context, would they be able to know where it is from? You know? But yeah. yeah. Well, these are also usually systemic disease or it can be. Uh, we have the same situation <clears throat> with the HSA sarcomas where there are a few that don't have systemic disease and we call those presumed solely periodontal lymphomas and those definitely do much better than mm -hmm. the ones that already have systemic disease mm -hmm. by the time of the infusion. Mm -hmm. So our next case is from a 10-month-old Devon Rex um, with the clinical history of being blind, um, having uveitis, um, having keratic uh, precipitates that uh, look like mutton fat, um, and cataract formation, uh, no glaucoma, and the under general medical conditions, this kitty has a hyperglobulinemia with an albumin to globulin ratio of 0 0.6. Hopefully that's painting a very nice picture. Um, so um, the gross image up there as represented by the star um, is not of the actual case that I'm presenting uh, since we didn't take a gross picture, but this is pretty, um, this gross picture is pretty representative of what um, this case would look like. Um, um, so we can see that the vitreous um, is very cloudy and very gel-like, um, indicative of like a high proteinaceous uh, material um, in the vitreous. Uh, the retina is detached. Um, and I think you can see um, this kind of white uh, material kind of lining uh, the inner aspects of uh, the structures in the eye. And that was pretty... Um, pretty representative of what we saw um, histologically as well. So. Right. so. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> so. Um, so we have that uh, bright eosinophilic uh, material, not only in the vitreous, but also um, in the anterior portions of the globe. Um, the retina is detached, um, and there is a lot of uh, purple in the cells, sort of all around the inner structures of the eye. All right. Uh, so here is our proteinaceous material. And as we come around, we can see that as we get closer, um, kind of lining the structures of the eye, um, There's a large population of inflammatory cells um, comprising uh, lymphocytes, a large number of plasma cells um, and macrophages. So lymphoplasmacytic and histocytic, um, like endophthalmitis. Um, they also infiltrate into the uvea. Very plasma cell rich. Very plasma cell rich, um, which goes along probably with the hyperglobulina. Right. <laughs> um, so, yep, it infiltrates uh, all aspects of the uvea. Um, here, lines it. It's all over. You can see it also affecting the retina. So, 
retina is a lot more hypercellular than it usually is. So it's infiltrated by the inflammatory cells and that are lining it while it's detached. The outer macrophage layer of the retina. <laughs> yep. You can see it starts to creep into the optic nerve as well. The optic nerve head here. Um, then just to sort of, whoops, too far. Um, to round things off, um, there's a little bit of corneal disease. Um, we saw some better, some good portions of it earlier, a little bit of mineral accumulation um, underneath the corneal epithelium, so some band keratopathy, um, but otherwise fairly mild um, uh, inflammation and uh, vascularization in the cornea as well. Uh, there's also cataract change in the lens. Um, so we have this like plasma cell rich, um, lymphoplasmacidic, acidic, and even neutrophilic sort of uh, panuveitis, uh, endophthalmitis, retinitis, optic neuritis, all the things, um, and this uh, really protein rich uh, intraocular exudate. Um, and that's uh, given the age um, and uh, cat, um, this is pretty suggestive of feline infectious peritonitis. Um, and uh, we did offer some immunohistochemistry um, to look for feline coronavirus, uh, which they took us up on. And we did get a nice uh, positive result. Um, uh, with some strong uh, granular cytoplasmic immunolabeling to the macrophages um, in the detached retina. Um, so again, supporting the diagnosis of feline infectious peritonitis. It's just kind of a nice classic case. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Uh, next up. Um, is another cat, uh, but this one an adult, an eight-year-old, uh, male neutered American long hair cat uh, with a history of uh, bluthalmus, so big eye, absent menace, um, and unable to visualize the iris. Um, and the other eye also has some corneal edema and absent menace and some additional history for this kitty cat. Um, it was found as a stray in 2018, and back then, um, on physical exam, uh, both lenses were opaque, um, with evidence of uveitis and a reddish appearance. Um, it had no PLRs or menace bilaterally. Um, so, uh, grossly, uh, we can see that the cornea is uh, really thickened and opaque. And you can see that the inner structures are kind of um, effaced uh, by white uh, tissue and cellular infiltrate. Um, the lens is, is here, um, it's kind of opaque uh, looking as well, and a lot of uh, white um, material in the vitreous uh, as well. All right. Let's go. Look at this. Um, all right. So up front cornea, as we make our way back, uh, we can see that there's uh, a lot of blue um, throughout uh, the globe. Um, so indicative of cellular infiltrate that comes out, um, extends through the sclera um, into the episcleral tissue um, and kind of effaces um, the choroid and is present in the vitreous um, as well. Okay. 
just going to cruise around here. So here's our um, cellular infiltrate, um, low power, um, looking kind of spindly, forming uh, bundles. Uh, we've got these bright pink areas here is coalescing areas of necrosis. So just to give like an overview here. Uh, so we have a spindle cell population um, uh, facing many structures of the globe, um, forming uh, intersecting streams um, of spindle cells with a little bit of eosinophilic cytoplasm, um, oval with elongate nuclei um, with some mitotic activity here. Um, and here is our lens capsule and it is ruptured. And there's a lot of necrotic cellular stuff in the front here in the anterior chamber that kind of connects with the lens capsule rupture and appears to kind of be coming and attaching to um, lens capsule. And in here we have some leftover collagen um, from fibrous metaplasia from the lens epithelial cells. And it seems to be um, continuous uh, with this necrotic um, presumed neoplastic tissue here. Um, so uh, we are calling this uh, post-traumatic uh, sarcoma in the cat, a spindle cell variant. Um, that usually arises um, after ocular trauma um, and um, neoplastic transformation of like the lens epithelial cells and coming out and effacing uh, the eye. Um, let's see. So again, it's coming through the sclera here. Um, it does extend to the edge of our tissue section. Uh, this was a um, a well trimmed gro globed, um, so um, that means that we received it with the tissues cut off of it already. Um, so unsure if this uh, is representative of a true margin uh, per se, um, which is important for um, local recurrence um, of the tumor. Um, the other thing that we look for is invasion into the optic nerve um, for extension um, elsewhere, um, where um, in this case, it did not go into the optic nerve. Um, so that's for distant metastasis, I guess, uh, better um, for that. Um, so, oh, yep. And then we have um, that thickened cornea with a lot of corneal disease, a lot of inflammation, blood vessels, um, we've got uh, large ulceration here um, and parts of it, um, the epithelial flap um, coming up, um, kind of lose a little bit of polarity uh, to the cells at the edge here. Um, so indolent ulcer as well. Um, yeah, so. Uh, yep, so feline ocular post-traumatic sarcoma, um, spindle cell variant um, with some dirty orbital margins, um, potentially. Uh, so making sure to monitor for local uh, recurrence or growth of the tumor um, in the orbit, um, that indolent ulcer, and then the hypermature cataract with lens capsule uh, rupture um, associated um, with the tumor formation. Um, and I think the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, that you can have a protracted uh, timeline um, for tumor formation. Um, so there can be, um, uh, I, I guess we find an average of seven years between ocular trauma and when tumor um, neoplastic cells develop. Um, so it may not be something that occurs right away after the trauma, and it could be a uh, uh, long ways down the road um, before you see tumor development. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for this case. I mean, I have a question, mm -hmm. but does it have to be trauma? 
Is it just me and I'm not so what kind of time like high up and not be the purpose for my second one? I think you could. The so the, the question was, does it have to be trauma or can it be a lens capsule rupture from a cataract? Um, I get you know, yeah, the it doesn't need to be trauma. I think the main the main event is um rupture of the lens capsule and allowing the lens epithelial cells to gain access to the extra lenticular space and proliferate. The thing with cats is how often do you guys see spontaneous lens capsule rupture, right? It's very rare. So I think that's why we often when we see lens capsule rupture in cats, we very often think of trauma, um, unless it's something congenital, right? Like a persistent uh, fetal vasculature, but like, but it's not rupture, it's like incomplete closure of the lens capsule. But, you know, in dogs, spontaneous lens capsule rupture, I think is more common with like diabetic and somatic cataracts and things like that. But in cats, um, we assume it's trauma anyway. So that's usually why. We have a single case of what we thought was a fully intralenticular post-traumatic sarcoma, quote unquote, or a sarcoma that oh, yeah. probably arose mm -hmm. associated with the lens epithelium in a, what was a hypermature cataract, um, but it did not extend anywhere outside of the lens. Um, so that was kind of an interesting case. I think that's rare. Right. But maybe that could happen occasionally and then it ruptures eventually and right. spreads around the eye. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I can't remember if Jamie mentioned it, but the characteristic feature of gross and like subgross of these tumors, these post-traumatic tumors, is um the circumferential involvement of the entire uvea, um, at least at the more advanced stages. So it, it effaces the anterior uvea and then also will efface parts of the posterior segment as well. And that's true of the spindle cell variant and the round cell variant or the lymphoma. Um, and also the other much more rare variants, which are the osteosarcoma or chondrosarcoma or osteochondrosarcoma. So. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks for tuning in. See you guys in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.